much. And that concludes general questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one from Ruth Davidson. Thank you. Presiding officer, economic growth in Scotland is a third of the rate of that of the UK as a whole. Also, this SNP government's economic plan has been lost in the weeds thanks to a myriad of different strategies, advisory groups and bodies now cluttering the landscape. Does the First Minister think that these two facts are connected? First Minister. Well, firstly, in, in terms of the landscape, uh, that of course is why uh, the Scottish Government has recently established the new strategic board to better align the work of our enterprise and skills agencies. Something that in many aspects I seem to recall was opposed by other parties in this chamber. Uh, and we want to make sure that through that strategic board, uh, which of course is ably chaired by Nora Senior, then we get maximum impact and value for the uh, around £2 billion every year that we spend on enterprise and skills. Uh, let me come to the point on economic growth, though, because it's, it's quite interesting. I, I suspect Ruth Davison has partly been prompted in her questioning today by yesterday's Fraser of Allender Institute report. Uh, and I'm sure she's paid it very close attention because uh, Ruth Davison, for the past number of months now, has hitched her uh, wagon to the claim that growth in Scotland is projected to be lower than it is in the rest of the UK. But of course, when you look at the Fraser of Allender Institute report yesterday, what we see is that their growth projections for Scotland next year and the year after are actually higher than the OBR projections for the rest of the UK. And projected unemployment is lower than the UK. And when we add that to the fact that productivity growth has been higher in Scotland over the last decade or that our international goods exports are growing at a faster rate, uh, than in the rest of the UK, then I would suggest that Ruth Davidson's arguments simply are shown to be nonsense and fall to pieces altogether. But the final point I would make, presiding officer, is this one. Ruth Davidson, uh, particularly today, which marks a year to go to her party, drags us out of the EU against our will, has no credibility on the economy for as long as she supports a hard Brexit. She can't lecture others on economic growth when she's supporting a policy that all of the experts say will hit growth in this country by more than £2,000 per person. Uh, so Ruth Davidson's credibility on the economy is zero. Ruth Davidson. I'm delighted the First Minister mentioned the Fraser of Allender Institute and its report into the Scottish Government. And if the presiding officer will permit me the time, let's quickly just run through the list it produced, setting out the Scottish Government's streamlined plan for the economy. There's an economic growth strategy, a digital strategy, an energy strategy, a circular economy strategy, a climate change plan, a trade and investment strategy, a labour market strategy, a social enterprise strategy, a hydro nation strategy. There's a strategy action plan for women in enterprise, a STEM strategy, a manufacturing action plan, a youth employment strategy, an innovation action plan, a national islands plan, an agenda for cities, and finally, an Arctic strategy. It is overseen by a grand total of nine government agencies, 32 local authorities, and in turn, they're informed by at least 18 further advisory boards. So let's look at what the Fraser of Allender Institute says. They say, Back in 2007, the Scottish Government promised a streamlined and effective policy landscape for the economy. Ten years later, it may be time to look again. That's just them being polite, isn't it, First Minister? First Minister. Well, Ruth Davidson mentions uh, the Arctic. I think it's certainly true to say that Scotland's going cold uh, on the Tories. Uh, that <laughs> is the case. But Ruth Davidson... Ruth Davidson lists, uh, lists a number uh, of strategies. Women in enterprise, for example, extremely important. We know, for example, if women were to start businesses in Scotland at the same rate as men, it would be worth billions of pounds to our economy. So as she lists these strategies, perhaps Ruth Davidson will stand up in her next uh, question to me uh, and list the ones she wants the Scottish Government to scrap. I would be very keen to hear her uh, answer that uh, question. But the Strategic Board, of course, is all about making sure that all of that work 
uh, is aligned. Uh, I think Nora Senior chairing that board will do a very, very good job and they are already uh, hard at work. Uh, but Ruth Davidson wants to quote from the Fraser of Allender uh, Institute. So let me uh, quote some more uh, from that report. Scotland has a strong and prosperous economy, uh, page four. Uh, Scotland has clear economic strengths, page 24. Uh, Scotland's labour market has held up well uh, despite a challenging environment, uh, page uh, 16. Also on that page, unemployment remains low by historical standards. Uh, page four again, Scottish exports have grown relatively strongly in 2017. And of course, as I said, the uh, Fraser of Allender uh, projections for growth for Scotland are higher next year and the year after than the OBRs uh, are for the UK, which seems to hold Ruth Davidson's argument entirely below the waterline. Uh, but let me finally, presiding officer, come back to what is possibly the most important quote in the report, which again is on page four, if Ruth Davidson wants to look it up, and it's this one. And as I said, and I know Ruth Davidson doesn't like hearing this, this is particularly relevant today because it says this, Brexit remains the biggest challenge on the horizon. So as long as Ruth Davidson is supporting a policy that is going to damage growth in the economy, she has no credibility. So perhaps she wants to, the next time she gets her feet in a few seconds time, tell us, will she go back to her old position of supporting membership of the European Union? And if she won't go back to that, will she go back to her old position of retaining membership of the single market? Because if she doesn't, I say again, she has zero credibility on the economy. Ruth Davidson. Officer, the truth of it is clear that if strategies and press releases were enough to grow the Scottish economy, we'd be steaming ahead by now. But as it is, we are trapped in an SNP slowly. Now, I know the First Minister likes to point the finger at Brexit for everything. She's done it twice already today. So how can she explain this? Not only is growth for Scotland running at a third of that of the UK, but small business confidence in Scotland is at minus 18, whereas in the rest of the UK it's at plus six, which is a 24 point gap. So let me ask the First Minister this. She blames Brexit for everything. Might it not just conceivably be possible that our problems lie slightly closer to home? First Minister. Ruth Davidson, uh, I can understand why she wants to ignore uh, the fact that I've now pointed out twice that the economic uh, growth projections in the Fraser of Allender Institute report for next year and the year after are actually higher for Scotland than the OBRs are for the rest of the UK. I'm not sure uh, whether uh, Ruth Davidson is prepared uh, to lay the reasons for that uh, at the door of Theresa May, but she wants to ignore the elephant in the room that is Brexit. So I'm going to remind her of some of the figures and it is simply not credible to come here and say that you're really really concerned about economic growth when you know as Ruth Davidson does what the figures show that the impact of Brexit is going to be so if we uh, fall back in uh, WTO trading rules we know that will hit our economy to the tune of more than two thousand uh, pounds uh, per person that's eight and a half percent hit to our GDP. A free trade agreement with the EU would reduce growth by 6.1%, uh, which is £1,600 per person. EEA membership, the least damaging option, uh, would still hit growth by 2.7%, £700 per person. Does Ruth Davis want to tell us which of these options does she support? Because all of them hit growth in our economy. It's the Tories that are taking us out of the EU. And as long as that is the case, uh, they have no credibility coming here to talk about economic growth. And everybody out there knows it. Absolutely. Ruth Davidson. Here's where we stand. Scotland is economically underperforming now. She says that Brexit is to blame, but there's still a year to go. And we've had 10 years wasted under an SNP government. And this is their record. The lowest rate of business growth in the UK, productivity in Scotland at the lowest level in eight years. And for the next three years, the weakest projected economic growth of any country, not just in the OECD, but in the EU. Isn't it time she stopped simply blaming Brexit and looked to herself to get Scotland's economy moving? First Minister. Let's look at Scotland's performance. I won't repeat for a fourth time, I think, the points about growth in the Fraser of Allender Institute report. Perhaps, perhaps Ruth Davidson, when she gets the, the chance, can go and read it. But let's look at some 
of the uh, other aspects uh, of growth. Productivity growth higher in Scotland over the last decade than in the rest of the UK. International goods exports, and these are figures from just the last year, growing at a faster rate than any other part of the UK at 19 uh, percent. We've got unemployment close to a record low. I think for uh, something like 11 out of the last 13 months, unemployment in Scotland has either been lower than or the same as it has been in the rest of the UK. We've got youth employment at a higher rate than the rest of the UK. We've got female employment at a higher rate than the rest of the UK. Scotland's economy is strong and we are determined to make it even stronger. But we do that against the challenge of ideologically obsessed Tory Brexiteers who want to rip our country out of the EU against our will. That is the reality. Question number two, Richard Leonard. A presiding officer, three years ago, the First Minister told the Daily Record newspaper that education was her top priority. As she said, and I'll quote her, over the next months and years, making sure the Scottish education system becomes genuinely one of the best in the world will be a driving and defining priority of my government. How does the prospect of Scotland's teachers taking industrial action because of this government's mishandling of their pay and workload help with that aim? First Minister. Uh, well well, clearly it wouldn't, which is why we don't want to be in that situation, which is why uh, we became the first government anywhere uh, in the UK. And I think generally, uh, when you take the NHS out of the equation, still the only government anywhere in the UK, including the Welsh government in Wales, that has lifted the 1% public sector yeah. pay cap. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, negotiations about pay are underway. In the case of teachers, these are tripartite negotiations that involve the unions, the uh, councils as employers, and of course, the government. So the government are involved in these negotiations. Uh, they will continue, I hope, Constructively, and I hope we get to uh, an end result here that avoids the scenario Richard Leonard uh, has outlined and make sure uh, that our teachers get uh, a pay rise, a decent pay rise uh, that they deserve and we can all go on with the rest of our work, uh, very detailed work in raising attainment in our schools. Because I should point out to Richard Leonard, I didn't just say it three years ago in the Daily uh, Record, if he's been listening, he'll have heard me say it countless times since. Richard Leonard. Presiding officer, the fact is that under this government, teachers have seen their pay fall in value by 25% in real terms. They have gone from being amongst the best paid teachers in the developed world to amongst the worst. They have seen 3,500 of their colleagues disappear from the classroom. And they are now teaching some of the biggest classes in the Western world. So is it any wonder that so many teacher training places lie vacant? Is it any wonder that Scotland's teachers feel undervalued? Is it any wonder that they are saying, now is the time for action? First Minister, you cannot close the attainment gap between the richest and poorest children in our schools with underpaid and overworked teachers. So, I've spent, I've spent a few mornings recently on the picket line outside Scotland's universities. I don't want to find myself on the picket line outside Scotland's schools, but if I have to, I will. Because I value education and I value our teachers. First Minister, what are you going to do to show that you value our teachers? First Minister. So, what I, uh, with my colleagues in the Scottish Government, have done, of course, is lift the 1% public sector pay gap. Now uh, that uh, provides the starting point for the negotiations, the tripart negotiations that I've spoken about, but it is a bit rich, is it not, for Richard Leonard uh, to come here and ask me, I'm perfectly entitled to ask me uh, these questions, but when his own Labour colleagues in Wales haven't done what this government has done. They haven't lifted the 1% public sector pay cap. So we have done that because uniquely amongst governments across the UK, we recognise that that pay restraint cannot continue. That pay restraint it was, of course, designed 
to save jobs uh, during the recession. Uh, but we recognise with the rising cost of living, that is not sustainable. That's why we've taken the action of lifting the public sector 1% pay cap. And we will now go into negotiations, not with, just with teachers, uh, but with the health service unions as well, making sure that our public sector workers are properly rewarded and that we get on with the job of improving the quality of our vital public services as well. So that's what I'm doing. Uh, and I'll continue to get on with that job. And Richard Leonard can go and spend his time in whatever way he sees fit. Richard Leonard. <laughs> First Minister, this is urgent. Uh, yes. The pay review is due to conclude with a pay rise being implemented in April, which is, which is this weekend. You sit at the negotiating table. Local authorities have had their budgets cut year on year. The only thing which can stop our schools facing industrial action and our children's education facing disruption it's the Scottish Government finally paying teachers what they are worth. First Minister, if education really is your driving and defining priority, will you agree and will you fund a proper fair pay rise for our teachers? First Minister. Actually, lo local government budgets are being increased in real terms in the coming financial year. Something that I should remind Richard Leonard, he and his Labour colleagues voted against in the budget. So again, it's a bit rich to come here and talk about things and ask me to, to do things uh, that him and his colleagues here in Scotland and elsewhere across the UK don't do when they've got the opportunity to do it. So real terms increases for councils. We're also, as we've uh, talked about many times in this chamber, uh, directing over the life of this parliament £750 million through our attainment fund. Uh, much of that money going direct to head teachers to spend on measures to raise attainment. And in terms of teachers' pay, I make no apology for the fact uh, that we will take forward these discussions in the proper way through the tripartite negotiation framework that is in place. So, as Richard Leonard rightly says, the government is a part of that and we will take these negotiations forward forward in good faith and I would have thought as a former trade union official I think he would welcome that commitment to ongoing proper negotiation. Well, a couple of constituency questions the first from Fulton McGregor. I'm grateful that you've allowed me to ask this question presiding officer in place with my colleague Alec Neil, who is unable to do so himself as he's at a funeral. Following yesterday's announcement that TOM in Airdrie is to close with the loss of over 400 jobs many who are from my a uh, own constituency of Coatbridge and Chryson, can the First Minister outline what support she and the Scottish Government is providing to ensure these jobs are saved? First Minister. Well, I was extremely concerned to learn the news that TOM Group uh, Limited has entered administration and I know that this will be an extremely difficult time for the employees uh, of that company and uh, their families and also for the local community affected by this decision. Uh, Scottish Enterprise has already contacted the administrators to understand whether it can provide any assistance and I, I noted uh, remarks from the administrator regarding the potential to find a buyer for Alistair Fleming Limited in Kilmarnock which may uh, see the employees of that subsidiary transfer to new owners. In addition to working positively where we can with the administrators, uh, our Partnership Action for Continuing Employment PACE uh, team met yesterday with employees at the base in Airdrie. Uh, arrangements are underway for a PACE event to take place next Friday, the 6th of April, to which all employees will be invited. Uh, by providing skills development and employability support, PACE aims to help anybody affected by redundancy get back into work as quickly as possible. So I can assure uh, Fulton McGregor and, of course, Alec Neil, who is the constituency member, that the Scottish Government will continue to take whatever action we can to support both the company uh, and, crucially, the employees affected. Thank you. John Scott. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, the First Minister will be aware of NHS Ayrshire and Ireland's projected year-end deficit of £23 million, caused by efficiency savings not being delivered and, more understandably, by winter pressures through December, January and February and the need to provide bed space and local doctors to meet the highest demand rate in Scotland at that time. Notwithstanding the efficiency savings not being met, will she now support NHS Ayrshire and Ireland's request for loan funding to cover this deficit or brokerage, to use the technical term? First Minister. As I understand that this is already <coughs> being discussed with NHS Ayrshire and Arran and uh, there is a commitment from the government in principle to provide uh, what we call brokerage support to uh, deal with the situation that John Scott uh, has outlined today. I'm sure the Health Secretary would be happy to update him as these discussions conclude. Jackie Bailey. 
On the day the First Minister was meeting the STUC to discuss fair work, SNP councillors in Western Bartonshire were cutting jobs and cutting trade union facility time. Can I ask the First Minister if she agrees with this attack on trade unions and whether she believes that these actions fit with the fair work agenda that she so rightly promotes? First Minister. Uh, well, obviously uh, it's for local uh, councils to take uh, decisions that they uh, consider appropriate uh, but I made very clear in fact in that meeting this particular uh, case was raised by trade unions rightly and understandably raised by trade unions and I made very clear to them as I will do publicly in this chamber today uh, my support for facility time and properly resourced facility time, uh, not just because I think that is right for trade unions, uh, but it also uh, helps employers and it's good for good positive industrial relations. I, I saw that when I was health secretary in the health service uh, and I think that principle uh, applies much more widely as well. So I would consider uh, cutting facility time uh, to be false economy actually uh, by uh, any employers and I would encourage all employers, whether they're local authorities uh, or any other public sector or indeed private sector, to employer to see the value of facility time. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, on our visit to air today, the Prime Minister announced that the UK Government will formally begin talks with local partners for a new growth deal for Ayrshire. This is after... <laughs> This is after considerable pressure applied by Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Yeah. Patricia Gibson, yeah. MP. Yeah. Patricia Gibson, MP, who led a Commons debate on the deal in this Parliament's Local Government and Communities Committee. The deal is expected to significantly bolster Ayrshire's economy, create jobs and boost productivity. While welcoming this announcement, does she agree that we need a timetable for action which the Scottish Government and the three Ayrshire Councils have sought since 2016 and which we did not get from the Prime Minister this morning? Yeah. Yeah. First Minister. I agree with that very much. I mean, if a commitment to talk about uh, an Ayrshire growth deal uh, is enough for the Tories to cheer, then it shows they don't have very much else to be <laughs> cheerful about. You know, I, I, I welcome the commitment as far as it goes, but I think the time for talking is coming to an end. Isn't it time for the Tory government to put their money where their mouth is for Ayrshire? The Scottish government, the Scottish government is ready to do that. When will the Tories be ready to do that as well? We have at least matched every growth deal that's been announced so far. In some cases, we have more than matched these growth deals. Uh, I don't know why the Tories are dragging their feet over my uh, home county of Ayrshire, but I hope we can tie them down to a timetable and we can replace the warm words that we heard from the Prime Minister this morning with some cold, hard cash from the Tories. That's what people in Ayrshire want. And Liam MacArthur. Thank you, President. Officer. Last August, the First Minister finally committed to introducing road equivalent tariff on Northern Isles ferry routes from the summer 2018, 10 years after it was introduced on West Coast routes. As we approach the Easter weekend, however, there's still no sign of the cheaper ferry fares being introduced, and more worryingly still, not even a formal start date. Does the First Minister accept that this ongoing lack of clarity is unhelpful, particularly for the island's vital tourism sector, which relies heavily on advance bookings over the peak summer period? And will she commit to ensuring that a formal start date for the long overdue introduction of RET on routes serving Orkney and Shetland is announced before Parliament returns after the Easter recess. Yeah. Yeah. First Minister. I do agree with Liam MacArthur about the, the potential of RET and we've seen uh, that potential turn into reality in other parts of Scotland where uh, that has already been introduced. Um, I will ask Hamza Yousaf to write uh, to the member with an update on the time scale and uh, the start date for that and I'm sure he will be uh, very willing uh, to uh, talk to the member further and I'm sure Liam MacArthur will come back to this chamber if he's not satisfied uh, with that answer but I very much hope he will be. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. It is just a year until the UK government proposes to take us out of Europe uh, in defiance not only of the way people in Scotland voted, but in defiance uh, of the facts about the country's best interests. And as ever more information becomes public about the fundamentally compromised nature of the referendum process, it's hard to believe that the UK government's Brexit extremists are not only unwilling to take seriously the questions about the legitimacy of the result, but are even prepared to use the sexuality of a whistleblower to discredit him. Will the First Minister commit not only to continuing to oppose the Brexit process in principle, 
but also if this is done to us and we are dragged out of Europe to immediately campaign to get back in as a full member state. First Minister. My, my views on membership of the European Union are any mystery. I oppose Brexit in principle. I don't want us to leave the EU uh, and I want to see Scotland continue uh, to be a proud European uh, nation. Um, in terms of some of the other aspects to Patrick Harvey's question, I thought, uh, well, I think many uh, of the revelations we've heard and many of the allegations we've heard over the last couple of weeks are deeply and profoundly concerning. Uh, I thought the outing uh, of the whistleblower uh, by a member of number 10 staff was utterly disgraceful and should be condemned by everybody. Uh, and I think the Prime Minister's response uh, to that was woefully inadequate. Uh, I think there's also been very serious questions raised in the past number of days about the conduct of the Leave campaign. Clearly, I can't answer those questions, but I think those questions made it very serious and in-depth investigation. Uh, we are today one year from the date when the UK is supposed to leave the European Union. And what I think is uh, utterly inexplicable and shameful is the fact that people today uh, don't have any more detailed answers to the questions that they had about the future relationship with the European Union than they did on referendum day. And that, I think, is largely because we have a deeply divided Tory party that are putting uh, their ideological interests ahead of the interests of the country. And for as long as that remains the case, uh, then the interests of not just Scotland, but the whole UK are going to be deeply uh, damaged. Uh, and that will be the Tory legacy to Scotland uh, and to the rest of the UK. And I think future generations will never, ever forgive them for it. Patrick Harvey. The Greens will certainly continue to be committed to this country's European future. We are a European country and we will continue to be so, even if it takes time to get back in. But the, the Scottish Government's Brexit legislation does at least include better uh, inclusion than the UK legislation of environmental principles. And the Scottish Government has said that it supports evidence-based policy. But the, the Scottish Government doesn't always like the consequences. One of the environmental resources which can clearly only be managed on a shared basis between countries is fish. Uh, will the First Minister accept that without the common fisheries policy, we wouldn't have cod left either in the sea or in the shops? And surely the Scottish Government must accept that whether we're in or out of the European Union, that shared approach to a shared environmental resource will always be necessary. First Minister. I actually think Scottish fishermen over the past number of years uh, have discharged their responsibilities uh, to conservation and I think they should be credited for doing that. But equally, uh, I'm on record, my party is on record, I think it was back in 2004, uh, that an SNP MP introduced a member's bill in the House of Commons uh, to try to uh, argue that we should come out of the common fisheries policy. The common fisheries policy, even taking account, I think, of the points that Patrick Harvey uh, makes, uh, is not fair to Scottish fishermen. That's why I uh, don't support it. Uh, more generally, I think he's right to say that uh, our continuity bill does give greater protection to, for example, the Charter of Fundamental Rights, to environmental protections. Uh, and of course, it's possibly because uh, the UK government knows that the Scottish government wants to continue to extend protections like that, uh, that they are still trying that power grab to centralise these powers in Westminster rather than pass these powers exactly to where they belong, which is this Scottish Parliament. A couple of further supplementaries. The first from Graham D. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the importance of continuing access to seasonal migrant labour for soft fruit farmers in my constituency and wider Scottish agriculture. On February the 4th, in a visit to Angus, Michael Gove promised farmers there would be complete clarity around establishing a seasonal agriculture worker scheme by March. Here we are at the end of March and nothing. And in the course of the last few days, we've had the Conservative Chair of Westminster's Rural Affairs Committee accuse the Immigration Minister of fiddling while Rome burns over this issue. Does the First Minister share my deep concern at the impact this disgraceful Tory inaction is having on Scottish agriculture? First Minister. This is the point the Tories look at their feet uh, uh -huh. in the uh -huh. chamber, of course. Uh -huh. That's what um, I'm doing. Or, or, or make lots of noise just to try to hide their deep embarrassment at what's happening. I think the, the, lesson, the lesson of at least the last 
year, the lesson of at least the last year, and perhaps Ruth Davidson might want to listen to this, is that we cannot trust a single word Michael Gove says. Yeah. And when his press releases are co-authored by Ruth Davidson, we clearly can't trust a single word she says uh, either. The fact of the matter is the clarity that was promised by Michael Gove and others has not been delivered. We have no more clarity today than we did on referendum day or uh, than we did on the day Article 50 was triggered. And that is disgraceful and it matters to people, the length and breadth of this country, it matters to people in our rural economy, it matters to people in our financial services sector, it matters to people in our national health services. Instead of shouting abuse when people have the temerity to raise it in this chamber, the Tories in this chamber should be utterly ashamed of the position that their party have put this country into. And Alison Johnson. I didn't hear that. Alison Johnson. Thank you. Um, new footage of the sickening slaughter of mountain hares is reported by the BBC today. Has the fact that this evidence comes from well-regarded animal welfare groups finally convinced the government that voluntary restraint is sadly lacking on too many Scottish shooting estates? When and with whom will the urgent meetings the government now seeks take place and when will the Scottish Government introduce new legal protection for this fabulous, iconic animal? First Minister. Well, I, I do share Alison Johnson's concern and indeed anger, because it's evident in her voice that some of the images that we're seeing on our screens uh, today, there is real public concern and we share the public concern about this iconic species of the Scottish mountains. Uh, Large-scale culling of mountain hares could, could put the conservation status uh, at risk and that is clearly unacceptable uh, and I know that the, the pictures that she refers to will be distressing to uh, many people. Uh, now Alison Johnson asked who the meetings that the Cabinet Secretary uh, has talked about will be with. Uh, these meetings will take place with all relevant stakeholders, landowner groups, gamekeepers and also environmental organisations. Uh, I want to be very clear today that the government is exploring all available options to prevent mass culls of mountain hares uh, and one of those options of course is legislation and a licensing scheme. Uh, what we are seeing is not acceptable uh, and that is a, a very clear message that goes from the government today. Question number four, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the role of food banks. First Minister. Well, my view is very simple. Nobody in a nation as rich as Scotland should have to use food banks uh, and we will continue to challenge UK government welfare cuts that are pushing so many people into crisis and into dependency on food banks. Uh, we want to eradicate the need for emergency food support in Scotland. We've established a £1 million a year fair food fund. Uh, that fund supports people in dignified ways to reduce and remove reliance on emergency food. Uh, and last week we announced a further £1 million over the next two years to support children facing food insecurity during school holidays. Uh, of course, we should remember uh, that notwithstanding our disgust that anybody has to rely on a food bank that for some they are right now a lifeline so we should also take the opportunity to thank both those who contribute to food banks as well as the many volunteers and staff that support them. Christine Graham. Uh, I thank the First Minister for her answer. First Minister there are at least seven food banks in my constituency. One even gave out food to 471 children. Now, while I'm sure, as you have said, we would all want to put in record our thanks to those who support them either as volunteers or contributing, isn't it shameful that we should all say that these should not exist in the first place? And would the First Minister agree with me that this is a terrible indictment of failed Tory policies, and in particular, the benefits system exacerbated by the rollout of universal credit? And there can be no greater indictment than to have children queuing for food parcels. First Minister. I absolutely uh, agree with that and it is an indictment of austerity and it is a, an indictment of Tory cuts to the social security safety net that should be uh, a valued part of any uh, decent society and uh, you know people don't have to take my uh, word for that. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation has said that the, just the benefits freeze is the single biggest policy driver behind rising poverty, hitting families in and out of work and it estimates that the UK government's policies will leave the poorest Third of, Ruth Davidson's chatting away there, she might want to listen uh, to this. Uh, the Resolution Foundation estimates that the UK government's policies will leave the poorest third of households 
on average, £745 a year worse off uh, by the time we get to 2022. Uh, the Resolution Foundation also says the coming year is set to be the second biggest single year of welfare cuts uh, since the crisis. So that is what is driving. These are the Tory cuts, Tory cuts that are driving real people to food banks across our country. It is utterly disgraceful. Uh, we should aspire to have a country where no child uh, and no family has to rely on food banks. That's why we will continue to do everything we can through the funds that I've already mentioned. But it's also why we will continue to argue against these cuts. And of course, we will continue to argue for power over welfare to lie in this parliament yeah. and so that we can ensure dignity for the poorest people in our society. Question number five, Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports that more than £400,000 was spent on consultants to oversee the British Transport Police merger. First Minister. At the costs of integration identified by the Scottish Police Authority and Police Scotland are, of course, small in comparison to the operational costs of transport policing. Uh, as is the case with any transformation, the service will require access to specialist skills and expertise if it is to deliver. Uh, the total cost of the contract of £400,000 is split equally between Police Scotland and the British Transport Police Authority, reflecting the partnership approach to integration. Uh, and that amount also covers the total cost of the contract up to the 1st of April 2019. In securing these skills, we expect the service to demonstrate best use of public funds with the necessary oversight being provided by the SPA. Liam Kerr. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Now, this isn't the only cost that is spiralling. Last week, the BTP Authority Board was told that another £700,000 could be spent on consultants in the next year, and that's just scoping. Then this morning, we see reports that there is a potential pensions black hole of £100 million. First Minister, the British Transport Police Federation have proposed an alternative structure that respects the devolution of transport policing but avoids many of these problems. Isn't it time to back those plans? First Minister. Well, just on the issue of pensions, I think it's important to point out again that the Scottish Government has made a very clear commitment uh, to a triple lock guarantee that will protect jobs, pay and pensions uh, for British Transport Police officers uh, and staff transferring to Police Scotland. Um, in terms of uh, the integration, that of course is overseen uh, by the Joint uh, Programme Board. Uh, the Joint Programme Board, of course, has uh, already uh, made analysis that is leading to a re-evaluation of the timescale for the integration, and that is right and proper, uh, that it continues to be overseen by that Programme Board, which of course involves uh, the SPA, the British Transport Police Authority, the UK Government and uh, the Scottish Government. So these decisions will continue uh, to be taken properly in good order and we will continue uh, to do everything we can to engage with the staff affected uh, as we proceed uh, with uh, this over uh, the next uh, few months. <coughs> Question number six, Anas Sarwar. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to reassure and protect communities in response to the Punish a Muslim campaign. First Minister. Well, can I uh, firstly say that I utterly condemn this uh, disgusting uh, so-called campaign and I do so in the strongest possible terms and I'm sure that that sentiment is shared across this chamber. Uh, we must all stand together against such hate and we must be clear that in Scotland we will always challenge prejudice and discrimination. Uh, we're engaging with the UK Government, with Police Scotland and with the Muslim Council for Scotland to ensure the safety of our valued Muslim communities. Uh, Police Scotland and Scottish Government officials attended the second meeting of the cross-party group on tackling Islamophobia on Tuesday, where I know this issue was discussed. We're also taking active steps to tackle prejudice and hate, uh, as outlined in my recent correspondence with Anna Sarwar. Anna Sarwar. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Can I ask members to please imagine that you're a Muslim woman or a child and you're reading this. And I emphasize women because there is a clear gender nature to racism and Islamophobia. Punish a Muslim. There'll be rewards based on actions taken. Verbally abuse a Muslim, 10 points. Pull the headscarf of a Muslim woman, 25 points. Throw acid in the face of a Muslim, 50 points. Beat up a Muslim, 100 points. Torture a Muslim using electrocution, skinning, or the use of a rack. 250 points. Butcher a Muslim using a gun, a knife, a vehicle, or otherwise, 500 points. Burn a mosque, 1,000 points. Shocking, shameful, and sickening. 
Uh, will the First Minister and indeed this Parliament send a message to all our diverse communities that this is as much your country as anyone else's, that this is your home and that we stand with you? But we do ask you please to go about your daily lives, but be more vigilant, to look out for each other, and if you see anything or suspect anything, to please report it to the police. And a message to the haters, an attack on one Scot, regardless of faith or race, is an attack on all Scots, and we will never let you win. Well, in some ways, I don't need to add uh, to Anna Sarwar's comments because I think he has captured everything that needs to be said. But just to be very clear that this message comes from me uh, as strongly as it does from anybody else, I'm going to, to add... Uh, some comments. Uh, in, in many ways, the, uh, what, what Anna Sarwar has just read out there, I, I find it very difficult to find words that are adequate to describe it or indeed to condemn it. It's sickening, it's appalling, it's disgusting, it's deeply disturbing, it's all of that and more, but I feel that none of that really uh, does uh, it justice and certainly doesn't do justice uh, to what I feel and I know all of us feel about that. Um, I uh, have, as many of us do, I have many friends and constituents uh, within the Muslim community, so I know and I see firsthand the impact that this kind of prejudice, hate, uh, discrimination has on them, and I feel uh, so deeply uh, for every single one of them. Um, and I do think it's very important uh, for us to recognise that these are attacks directed at the Muslim community, and, and none of us can pretend to know exactly how that feels. But all of us should be absolutely clear when we say that these attacks on the Muslim community or on any individual Muslim, we treat as attacks on all of us. This is, for all our political divisions and debates, this is one Scotland. And anybody who chooses to live here, no matter their faith, no matter the country they come from, this is their country, it is their home, we value them, we want them here. And that is the message that should ring out from this parliament. So whatever else divides us, let us be absolutely united in saying that those who perpetrate hate crime, because that's what it is, hate crime of this nature, will never ever be allowed to win because Scotland will stand united against them, and it is that unity that will always prevail. And question seven, Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And before I start, I'd just like to associate myself with the comments just made by Anna Sarwar and the First Minister. Uh, to ask the First Minister what progress the Scottish Government is making on negotiations regarding devolved powers in the light of it being one year until the UK is scheduled to leave the EU. First Minister. I've been very clear that the government uh, cannot and will not recommend that the Scottish Parliament gives its consent to the EU withdrawal bill without changes being made to protect devolution. Uh, we've already set out to the UK government the changes that could resolve this issue, uh, but they are still insisting on the right to take control of devolved powers uh, without the consent and regardless of the views of this parliament. Uh, we've repeatedly said that we are ready to agree UK-wide frameworks where these will be in the interests of, of Scotland, but these have to be agreed and not imposed. Of course, last week, uh, this parliament overwhelmingly passed the Scottish Continuity Bill, which provides an alternative should an agreement not be reached with the UK government on changes to the bill. However, we are continuing our discussions with the UK government and we will continue to make every effort to reach a conclusion that respects the devolution settlement. But proper uh, respect for the devolution settlement is absolutely a red line. I've said that before and I will continue to say it. Ivan McKee. I welcome the document published today by the government outlining the concerns of real people on Brexit. Would the First Minister agree with me that a lot of these concerns could be met by staying in the single market and as such it's time for the UK government to take seriously the proposals that have been made to keep the UK in the single market and the customs union rather than continuing to put the future of Scotland's interests at risk. First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I do agree. I, I want us to stay in the European Union. I, I couldn't be clearer about that. But if the UK is to leave the European Union, then there is absolutely no doubt whatsoever uh, that the least worst option, if I can describe it in that way, is to remain within the single market and 
the customs union. Uh, all of the economic analysis shows that that is the least damaging option. Um, and I think many of the other issues that people are worried about around freedom of movement, around the impact on different sectors, uh, would also be allayed if we were staying within the single market and the customs union. Uh, I still hope we can find a consensus that unites us around that issue. What gives me hope is that I know Ruth Davison used to believe it because I think the week after the referendum she challenged me in this chamber to protect our membership of the single market. So uh, if she can find it within herself to stand up and be counted on that again, I would certainly welcome that. And I know that there are voices uh, within uh, the Scottish Labour Party who just today are saying to Richard Leonard, stop supporting a Tory hard Brexit. That I think the wording is will he rise to the challenge uh, and I think some of his own colleagues have said that future generations will not forgive those who stand idly by and watch the Tories do real economic damage to our country. So I hope Ruth Davidson rediscovers her former convictions and I hope the voices in Scottish Labour calling for membership of the single market manage uh, to turn Richard Leonard away from being a hard uh, Brexiteer and into a more sensible position and if that happens this parliament can be united and then perhaps we can have greater influence on the direction of travel in the UK so my challenge goes out to those across this chamber to unite behind what is right for Scotland. Thank you and that concludes First Minister's questions. We move on to members' business in the name of Jamie Halker-Johnson on Scottish Apprenticeship Week. And we'll just take a few moments for the member and other members and ministers to change seats.